We're going to start Megillat Esther. There's so much to discuss. Let's put phones away. Let's open our heads. Because everything we're going to see that happens in Megillat Esther is going to happen again. And actually, is happening in another form. Because we're going to see that Megillat Esther is unique. That it's actually a microcosm to Biat HaMashiach. What they went through in those days, by Mahem, Bazman Hazeh, this is his man where it happens. So you can open up to your Megillah, the front of your books, there is a Megillah Esther. You are permitted to bring your own Megillah Esther if you prefer, but the entire Megillah is over here. Let's just get some dates down. Let's see where we are historically. So we know that there was a Beit HaMikdash, a temple in Yerushalayim that was built by First Temple. It's not a trick question. Who built the first temple in Yerushalayim? Shlomo HaMelech. King Solomon built the first temple. So we have King Solomon builds the first Beit HaMikdash, Rishon, and it stands on Harabayit, on Temple Mount, hence the expression Temple Mount. This mountain, by the way, is a famous mountain because we do know that Yaakov Avinu had a dream, a vision on that mountain of a ladder going from the earth up to Shemayim, right? And he saw angels on that ladder. He chose that spot to stop because his grandfather, Avraham, brought his father, Yitzhak, as a potential korban on that place, okay? This Beit Amir stood for 400 years until in the Jewish year 3, Three, one, nine. We have someone called Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar destroys the Babylonian, who destroys the Beit Hamikdash, and that's the first of four galuts, first of four exiles the Jewish people go through. Is the Babylonians who remove the Jewish people in that year. He takes over as king, and the Jewish people are spread around the world, primarily in one country, which was called Persia, Paras, Paras. Okay, and we're going to see how important that region is then, how important it is now, because it's all related. And we're going to jump. There's another leader in between, but someone called Balshatsar who takes over from Nebuchadnezzar when he dies, and he rules from 3386. Okay? So he takes over at that point. There is someone who takes over for one year, because he ends up dying. We'll see how and why later. Just get our dates in. Dariavesh, Darius. He takes over for one year. He takes over for one year. Now the Jewish people are in Galut. They're in exile in Paras, in Persia. Okay? And that is someone called Dariavesh, Darius. Right? Darius, he released from 3389 3, because Balshat only lives for uh, rules for three years before he dies in very interesting circumstances. And then comes someone you've all heard of, and we're going to talk about him. Primarily this semester, Achashverosh is how he's referred to by the rabbis and by the Megillah. Okay? And Achashverosh moves a lot of the Jewish people, and we're going to see moves a lot of the power base that was in Babylon, because remember Nebuchadnezzar was the head of Babylon, modern-day Iraq, and he moves it to a new place, which is Paras, Persia. He makes that the center of everything. And here we have the second of the four exiles where the Jewish people are now in Paras, in Persia. And that's where the entire story is going to be based out of. And he started to rule from 3393. 333. 9-3 is where, when Achashverosh takes over power. Now, there's some important background information 
that we need before we even begin the Megillah, because the Megillah begins the story in the middle. In the middle of something else that's going on. There's something else going on that the Megillah begins at an unusual place, at a party. But you're not going to understand the party, and nobody understands the party unless they know this very, very important information. And it comes from Jeremiah the prophet. Yirmiyahu Hanavi, Jeremiah the prophet, says something very interesting in chapter 29, verse 10. Okay. Actually, it's mentioned, I think, elsewhere. I think Daniel the prophet, and Daniel the prophet is going to appear in the story itself with a code name. Why is a code name we're going to see? Jeremiah the prophet tells the Jewish people if they don't do Teshuvah during the first temple period, which, by the way, was one of the great highlights of Jewish history, it really was an amazing time. However, they started to make mistakes towards the end of the Beit HaMikdash standing before it was destroyed. And he says that because of your sins, you are going to go into exile. Does anyone know for how long? This is a very important number. 70. He says, you're going to be in exile for 70 years. This you need to write down. 70 years, Jeremiah the prophet says. Now that's unusual. Because every other galot that we have hasn't got a set time. Okay? It's flexible, depending upon us. Now this exile we're in right now, whether it's the 4th or 5th is a discussion, we know that the Jewish people are going to be in there for a flexible amount of time, depending on us. This exile was different. This galut was different. Why? Because Yeremiah Navi said, you're going to be in exile for 70 years. That's it. And then Hashem is going to return you to the land of Israel, and you're going to have the opportunity to build the second Beit HaMikdash, which is what happened. However, nobody was exactly sure when to start the 70-year count. At what point do you start counting the 70 years? Do you start counting it when the first Jew leaves? Do you start counting it when the last Jew leaves? Do you start counting it when the leaders of the, of the generation are kicked out of Israel? Do you start counting it with the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash? What's the answer? Well, the answer is, at this point, they just didn't know. They were not aware of it. And there were a number of people who had different opinions and different calculations. We're going to see that Achashverosh had his calculation. We know that Mordechai and Esther had their calculation. Baal Shatzar had his calculation, which, by the way, was wrong. Vashti, who we're going to meet a little later, is going to have her calculation. By the way, she was an extremely wicked person, by the way. We're going to see that in the Megillah, she's not described too badly. She doesn't seem so bad, and we don't know how she dies in the Megillah. We have a tradition mentioned in the Gemara how she died, and she had a very gruesome death. But we're not told, and we're going to see why this is important, because the Megillah, this is very important, my friends, is going to be full of coding, codes. It's not explicit. It's not easy to figure out exactly what's going on. But you have to read between the lines. Why not? When Mordechai and Esther wrote the Megillah, because they were the authors, why didn't they just tell us exactly what was going on? For example, what happened to Vashti? Why not? What's the answer? Anyone know the answer? Why the Megillah is very, very coded, where everything is hidden away. We're not too sure of who's doing what and why. You'll see it's very mysterious. There's a number of reasons, but the main one I want to put into your heads right now is, listen very carefully, that this is not a story of redemption. It's a story of survival. Meaning that after the Megillah ends, Achash Verosh is still going to be alive and he gets a copy of the Megillah. And Esther, sorry to ruin the story, is going to remain married to Achashverosh after the whole story ends. And this actually takes a long time. This takes at least 17 to 20 years to go through. We're going to, it's read on Purim in 20, 30 minutes. 
It's actually a long story that took many, many years to unfold. And the end of it, Achashver is going to get a copy of Rabbi Hadjoff's Megillat Esther book, and they open up, and it's going to be like, what, this is all about me? And you make me look so terrible? So they didn't do that. They actually make Achashverosh not seem so bad. They're not going to detail a lot of the elements that happened. For example, the death and the murder of Vashti by Achashverosh. And there's going to be a lot of secrets and codes that are put inside the Megillah. This is all very, very, very important. Because you're going to have to double-click on a lot of words and phrases and ideas inside the Megillah to actually figure out what's going on. Are we all clear on this? Any questions so far? Fantastic. Ahash Verosh had his own calculation. Obviously, we're going to see he was wrong in his calculation as to when to begin this 70 years and when to end it. Okay? Now, imagine Ahash Verosh. We're going to figure out, we're going to see who this interesting individual was. He wasn't from any royal lineage, which is going to be a big problem for him. He was actually a soldier who went up the ranks and took on tremendous power and eventually became the sadistic, narcissistic, medieval-type leader of a major area of the world. 127 provinces, which is a lot of land that covers, we're going to see, a large amount of land, okay, as we'll see in a minute. So he's now in power. He's in control. He's doing everything, right? He's got all the power in his hands. And he had a calculation as to when the 70 years was over. What do you do at the end of the 70 years? Because remember, according to him, the 70 years are over and the Jewish people have not returned to the land of Israel. They're still in in. Persia, in Galut, actually all over the world, there were Jews spread out much further than Persia. It's just the power bases in Persia, the story occurs over here. So now, listen very carefully. What's happening right now, my friends, is that Achashverosh is now going to make a demonstration. What kind of demonstration is he going to make? That you, the Jewish people, are still in Galut. You're still in exile. The 70 years that your prophet Jeremiah spoke about and Daniel spoke about is done and you're still here. So how's he going to, what's he going to do? What do you think he would do in order to drive this point home? Think about it. Imagine you're Achashverosh and you've taken power not through any royal lineage but because you're a power-hungry individual that's built yourself up what exactly are you going to do? Stick it to them. You could stick it to them, right? Nah, 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 nah. You're still in exile. He could do that. But what's that going to happen? What's that going to do with his relationship with the Jewish people? They're going to not like him. So you can kill Jews in one of two ways. One, you can kill them physically, right? Like Hamas Yimachshimam and try to destroy them that way. But there's another way, and that is to kill them with love. And that's what he's going to do. He is going to do something quite extraordinary. He's going to throw a party, a big party, a lavish party. And he's going to invite everyone to see his wealth and his power. When I say everyone, I mean people, delegates from all over his kingdom, and his locality where his palace is based. Where is his palace based? In the capital of Paras, which was called Great Neck. No, I'm only kidding. The capital of Persia was called Shushan. Shushan. That's going to be the center of where all this action is going to take place. Actually, it's going to be in the center of Shushan, which has got another name. You know what that's called? The, the actual name of the city? No, no, not what it is today. Today it's probably Hamadan just outside there. No, 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 I don't mean that. It is true. The, the, the remnants are still there. No, I mean historically. So you have Shushan. That's what it was called back then. 
and there was an area inside Shushan that was actually cornered off that no one was allowed and except very, very important people called Shushan Habira. So you're going to see two areas, Shushan and the capital of Shushan called Shushan Habira. It's like uh, New York and then Manhattan. Or, um, you know what's better? Washington, D.C. And then you have the Capitol Hill, right? You've got you to have a certain pass to get to the inner, inner chambers. We're going to see that Mordechai has that pass because he's going to be a very important person. Okay, but not everyone does. And it was actually separated with a moat, with water, with water around Shushan Habira. Okay? So you can see all these terms come up again and again, and these are the definitions. So now you have three areas. We have Persia, we have Paras. Okay? This is Paras. Then you have an area inside that's called Shushan. They have an area inside there, which is open to very few people, called Shushan. Habira. Habira basically means the palace. Okay? That's the inner, inner sanctum where all of the decrees and all of the action is going to come from this one place over here, which was separated from the outside by a moat of water. By the way, why would he do that? Why would he... I mean, assuming it wasn't there naturally, why would he create this iron fence around his palace? Why does someone make an iron fence? To keep people out, right? Who does he want to keep out? No, 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 no. He's not so afraid of the Jews. He's more afraid of other people who want to try to kill him to take his power. He's a dictator. Achashverosh is the Kim Jong Un of his day, right? He is the dictator. And you need to have a lot of bodyguards because you could be assassinated. By the way, was he assassinated? Attempted assassination by Big Tan and Teresh. We're going to meet these two individuals a little bit later, who they were and why they tried to assassinate him. Okay, so that's all coming. Are we getting a picture of what's going on over here, my dear friends? Excellent, excellent. So now it's the end of the 70 years. Achashverosh wants to ingratiate himself, which is a fancy way of saying make himself popular among the people. And he's only been in power for three years. How do we know that? Because the Megillah tells us. Let's have a look at the first verse of the Megillah, because there's a lot of code words that you're going to have to now remember. For this semester, every Hebrew word that I write on the board, you need to know the translation of. So you don't need to know the translation of the entire Megillah, because that would be ridiculous. But there are certain very important code words, and names especially. The names of the Megillah are going to be extremely important. Esther isn't just a name. Achashverosh isn't just a name. Haman isn't just a name. These are code words that are revealing very important things to us. Are we clear? Okay. The first important word is the first word of the Megillah. Vayihi. What does Vayihi mean? And it was. By the way, have you ever started a sentence like that? And it was that I walked into Robert Hadjoff's class late. Is that a way to start a sentence? And it was. Just say. It started. The days of Achashverosh. Vayihi is a code word. Write this down, my dear friends. And it's a, a machlot exactly. But some say it's Vayihi. Some say when you see the word Vayihi with BMA. No. No. It means something bad is about to happen. Oh. Exactly. So they bring that and say, oh, it must be Vayi Bimei is bad. Because Vayi itself is good. We know in Maaseh Bereshit. So when you see Vayi Bimei, that means something in those days is going to be problematic. Okay? That's what we're going to see. So Vayi Bimei means something bad is about to happen. Which is very true, as you're going to see. Vayi Bimei. Vayi bin Soa, not Vayi bin Me. The word Vayi, right, that's the makhluk. They say Vayi could be good, could be bad. Vayi bin Me means something bad's about to happen. Bidjuk. Vayi bin Me, Achashverosh. Now we know Achashverosh is going to make it bad. Now remember, Achashverosh is not going to look bad in Megillah. He's actually going to look really good and like taken advantage of. And it's only because 
he's going to survive, and everyone's going to see who he really is. Okay? Now, the word Achashverosh... With Vayahi, so it just means, like, from back then. No, no, so Vayahi means, and it was. Yeah. Right? So it looks like, but it's a code word, which we see in the Torah, which Mordechai and Esther employ to teach us, Vayahi Bimei, that something bad is about to happen. This is not going to be an easy time for the Jewish people. As opposed to just Vayahi, which means something good potentially could happen, which is right, like creation of the world, or the Mishkan's about to be built, or whatever it is. So we know Vayahi Bimei, well, what's bad about to happen? What's the next word? Achashverosh. Achashverosh. Now, Achashverosh is a very interesting person. Achashverosh, first of all, the name itself means Ach Barosh. What does that mean? Please put your phones away. That's not what it means. Achash Verosh is, what's an Ach? A brother. Rosh means a head, which means he's the brother of another leader, another head. He's his brother. Not literally his brother, but he acts like a brother to Nebuchadnezzar, Balshatzar, not Dariavesh. We'll leave him aside. We're going to talk about him a little bit later. He was actually a good person. He wants to help us build the second temple, but definitely Achashverosh. So he's another brother, just like them. They acted badly towards us. He acted badly towards us as well. Achashverosh. Achashverosh also means, and you want to write this down, Ach Borosh. What's Ach Borosh? Ach is Ach. What's Ach? Ah, Achbar. No, 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 no. Ach means Ach, disgusting. Borosh. He gave us a headache. He kept changing his decrees and kept flip-flopping and treating us badly. So, ach, rosh, means he gave us an ach on the head. He drove us crazy, as the Gemara says. That's what the Gemara says. Ach, rosh. So, this is a code name. But remember, it has to be encoded because you can't make him seem bad. You can't call him achashverosh havrasha. Like, Haman, we're going to do that to. Because he's going to die at the end of the story. So he's finished. Sorry to ruin the end for you, but I think you knew it. But Achashverosh, not so. Okay? Which Achashverosh is this? Who Achashverosh hamolech mihodu ad? What does it say? Ad Kush. He ruled from Hodu ad Kush. Remember, anything I write down? You need to know. Hodu. What's Hodu? So most likely India is usually how it's translated. What's Kush? They, they, they translate it as, no, it's Paras. That's Paras. Kush they translate usually as Ethiopia. So he's ruling from India to Ethiopia. Now, those two locations aren't so close to each other. Let's just make a globe out of this for just a minute. Remember, everything on the board, you need to know and write down. That's my recommendation. So here's the globe. Okay? And there's Odu, and there's Kush, let's just say. So we have a Machloket in the Gemara, Rav and Shmuel. Rav and Shmuel. And what's the machloket? We're going to see a number of machloket in a number of arguments. By the way, there's an entire tractate of the Gemara called Megillah, which is obviously about this, right? So some say he ruled from here to here. Yeah, 120 prophets. Shh, guys, I'm so sorry, it's a small classroom. From Hodu al Kush, from here to here. And some say, no, 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 no. That's not what he ruled. He ruled from here to here. 127 provinces. A vast amount of land. That's the Machloket of Rav and Shmuel. Sheva for Esra, Mea Medina, 127 provinces. Where did he get all this land from? All this power? Where did dictators get their money, land, and power from? The guy they just killed who took over from them. Right? So basically, Achishverosh, if you remember, took it over from 
Belshazzar, took from Nebuchadnezzar, and basically passed it all down. This is important because a lot of what Ashverosh owns is going to be taken from previous dictators. The new dictator comes, kills the guy, and says, right, like, a, you know, in South America, new dictators pop up every, every few years as a new guy. Where do they get the money and power from? They kill the leader, and they take over. Nachon? Vayenu. I'm the new leader now. His palace is my palace. I'll put a few new chairs in there, a lick of paint. We're good to go. Shalom al Israel, or in his case, Shalom al Paras, right? And he takes over the entire power structure. So we're going to see this is important. Now, <clears throat> we said already, oh, by the way, very important. This number, one, two, seven, is an important number. Why is it an important number? There's another one, two, seven that we see in Jewish history. Does anyone know this number, 127? It's an unusual number. I've not seen it anywhere else except in... Oh, very good. Michal, you knew that? What was the answer? Sarimenu lived for? Seven years. Shevashanim. Twenty years. And Meyashana. 127. Rabbi Akiva was giving a class and he saw that some of his students were falling asleep. By the way, if it happens to Rabbi Akiva, I don't feel so bad when it happens to me. And he stopped the class and he said, in what merit did Esther Malka get to be queen of 127 provinces? Because you know she's about to marry Ahasuerus very, very soon. And he answered and said, I'll tell you. Because her great, 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 great grandmother, Sarah Amenu, got to live for 127 years. And why does the Torah tell us that Sarah lived for 127 years? Because she didn't waste any time. Her seven years were like when she was seven years old, when she was like 20 years old, when she was like... A hundred years old, every year of her life was spent perfectly. She didn't waste a moment. And then Rabbi Kiva said, if you treat time well, then your descendants will be able to treat time and space well. Because Sarah was the queen of time, and Esther was the queen of space. So in the merit of Sarah, using all of her time well, her great-great-great-great-granddaughter, Esther, is going to be a queen of a large area of land. And then he says, if you treat every country, right, like a year, and every month like a town or city, and every day, right, if you put as much importance into space as you do into time, great things will happen. So Jewish women who are going to be the feature of this whole story, are going to be the queens of time and space. Because when you live in this world, you live in time, and you live in space. And Esther is the queen of space because her great-great-great-grandmother, Sarah, was the queen of time. And maybe that's why Rabbi Akiva was giving that lesson to his students who are falling asleep, saying, you're wasting your time. You're sleeping through your classes. You're sleeping through life. Right? You're wasting your time. You're not creating any future for your descendants. That was what, well, I guess, the lesson he was teaching his students when, uh, when they were falling, uh, when they were shlufen in, uh, in his class. Okay? So that's Esther and Sarah, and they're connected by this number, 127. Okay? Very, very good. So now Ahasuerus made a calculation that the end of the 70 years fell during his leadership when in his leadership, though? In which year? The second verse is going to tell us. By Yamamahem in those days, Kishevet Hamelech Achashverosh Al Kiseh Malchotom. Achashverosh is sitting on his throne. Well, where else is he going to sit? By the way, Achashverosh had an incredible throne. He had it specially transported and created and made, and it had amazing abilities. It was mechanical, 
Some say it was almost miraculous how he created this throne, because you want to impress people from all over the world to see your amazing palace, which he's going to do in a minute, and his amazing throne, right? And he's in the third year of his reign. Bishnat Shalosh Lamalkon. Why is Miguel telling us in the third year of his reign? Because the 70 years that we spoke about ends in the third year of his reign. Do you understand? So why does it say he's sitting on his throne? It doesn't mean he's literally sitting on his throne for the entire year. It means after three years, he was very, very nervous up to that point that the Jewish people were going to leave and they were going to all return to Israel, build the second Beit Migdash, and when you lose the Jews in your society, what do you lose? Everything, right? It's all gone. You, you, you lost your doctors. You lost your lawyers. Right? You lost your accountants. You've lost the... You've got a brain drain. So he didn't want that to happen. He wants, so what's he going to do? He is going to make a party to celebrate... Listen very carefully. The end of the 70 years, as if to say, you're not going back. The end of the 70 years came. Jeremiah was wrong. He said you're going to go back. You're not going to go back because you're still here. By the way, Jeremiah wasn't wrong. He just started the count from a different point that was too early. About 20 years too early. Okay? You understand? It's just Achashverosh's count was off by years. And so now he throws this party and he invites all the Jews, every single Jew to celebrate. Why would he do that? Why is he inviting all the Jews to this party? What's he trying to say? To make them jealous? I wouldn't say jealous. He's trying to win them over. You're not going anywhere. It's not bad. How would you dress if you are Hashem? We're going to see that clothing is going to be a major feature. I want you to write down all the references to clothing in the Megillah. We'll see that each one of them is very, very important. And we're about to see the first one. Achashverosh is going to put on a costume. This is a costume party for him. The first reference in the Megillah to somebody dressing up someone. This is one of the reasons, one of the reasons we dress up on Purim. Right? We wear costumes. So he's going to get dressed up. Who's going to dress up as? Anybody know? Michal? No? Then you're in the right class, Baruch Hashem. He's going to get dressed up as the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. The high priest. How many garments did the high priest used to wear? Hmm? Eight. A regular Kohen, a Kohen head, a regular Kohen wore four garments. The Kohen Gadol wore eight. Now, eight is a very significant number. Not for now, but it usually references, or always references, the miraculous. Lamalamena Teva, above the natural order. That's what the number eight always represents. That's why there's eight days of Hanukkah. Baby gets a Brit meal on the eighth day. Right? Eight always references above the natural order. So the Kohen Gadol wore eight. So now Achashverosh gets dressed up as the Kohen Gadol. Actually, Balshatza did the same thing when he miscalculated the end of the 70 years as well. And there is a very famous painting by Rembrandt who was obsessed with the Gilat Esther actually with the entire Bible. And there's a, there's a few paintings. There's one painting of him which you may have seen of Balshatzar dressed up as the Kohen Gadol with writing on the wall. Right? And that night he died. He wrote, there was writing that appeared on the wall that said that he was about to die and his entire kingship was about to end that night. But in that drawing by Rembrandt, you look it up after class, you'll see him dressed up as the Kohen Gadol wearing these eight things. He's wearing the turban, right? He's got the mitznefet, the tzitz, right? The me'il. He's got the eight garments, right? The Kodot. He's got the whole eight garments. So now Achishverish throws a party. And we're going to see how big it is and how long it lasts. It's a long party. And he dresses up as the Kohen Gadol as if to say, you don't need to go back to Israel. I am your high priest. By the way, where do you get the clothing of the Kohen Gadol from? From? He stole it, not from the Beit HaMikdash. He stole it from Balshatzar, who stole it from Nebuchadnezzar, who stole it from the Beit HaMikdash. It got handed down. 
by the way, not just the clothing, all the implements in the, in the everything. We're going to see the gold and the silver and the tapestries was all stolen and he's going to use it to decorate his palace. This is one of the reasons the Jewish people were in big trouble for going to the party. Because you're celebrating? You're celebrating a party with all of the kalim, the vessels, and the Beit HaMikdash? How disgusting is that? The Jewish people, says Rav Shubh and his students, we're going to see, were actually held culpable for doing this. And the entire bad stuff that's about to happen came around primarily because they went to enjoy the party of Achashverosh. And if it's not bad enough that he celebrated the end of the 70s, you're not going back, but they're drinking wine and eating food from the kalim, the vessels of the Beit HaMikdash. Oh dear. Isn't that a terrible indictment against the Jewish people? I hear you're going to, um, I don't know, some big fancy official's party. But imagine drinking wine out of uh, kiddush cups from the Holocaust that were stolen. Now you get it right, and plates from the from the Holocaust. Oh, and enjoying a painting that was stolen from Jews and put in some German or other museum. That's bad, right? That's like you almost like partnering with this terrible, terrible event that had happened to your, to you or to your family before this event happened. Are we clear so far? Are we seeing how this party isn't just a party, it's the opening of a whole new chapter of history that's going to lead to some very, very bad situations for the Jewish people, and then God willing, we'll see better things. Okay, so by, in those days, he's sitting on his throne. That means he's now relaxed on his kingship. He's now relaxed in his kingship. Right? And he's in Shushan Ha, what does it say? Bira. So there he is. And it doesn't mean he's literally sitting on his throne. It means that now he's, he's uh, in, you know, it's difficult for you Americans. You don't have royalty. I come from Great Britain where we have royalty, right? So you see how it takes time to they consolidate their power. You know, you know, the, the queen died recently. And who took over? King Charles the third just took over yeah and some people were so happy because the queen was queen for a long time right you america you don't have royalty okay, you have the kardashians but you don't have real royalty you know to look up to so there's actually something to be said right you have a king of morocco right you have kings and... so there's good kings and bad kings. there's good queens and bad queens right throughout history a good king is meant to be a wonderful thing for the people and we have kingship in judaism as well there were jewish kings shlomo hamelech David HaMelech, Shaul HaMelech, right? We're going to have good kings in Jewish history, but we're also going to have bad kings, and they're called dictators, okay? So we're going to see that as well. So now he is going to be a bad king, but right now he's trying to win over the hearts and minds of the people. You okay? Yeah. yeah move around a lot today. So he's going to try to win over the hearts and minds of the Jewish people at this point. Later on, it's going to get ugly. Okay. We are now on the third verse. Pshat Shemat Malka. He makes a mishtel. Chol saravadav chayil paras madai. Paras madai are two different locations and he's the king of these areas. V'sar midol So he's going to invite everyone. Now he feels confident. Just like a king takes time. A king Charles takes time to win over the hearts and minds and it took him three years Three years comes to an end. In addition, the Jewish people are not going anywhere. He throws a big party. Everything's fantastic. And he is winning them over. By the way, if you're Achashverosh, how would you cater this affair? Towards the Jews. How would you cater the affair towards the Jews? Kosher. How kosher? Very kosher. Right? Because you've got to make the food kosher enough that every Jew can eat there, right? You want every Jew to be able to 
have a good meal. You've got to cater for your most religious member. How about the alcohol? Kosher alcohol. Sound idea? Good idea? By the way, they used to have drinking contests at these parties. Imagine that. And people used to get so drunk they would become delirious and some people would die. We're going to see that Achashverosh is not going to do that. En ones. He's not going to force anyone to drink what they don't want to drink. All the wine is kosher. Mahadrin min mahadrin. All the food is kosher. Mahadrin min mahadrin. He had an OU, a star K. He had every single KLBD. You name it, every kosher symbol was in all the food. So the Jewish people are like, wow, he's catering for us. How can we not go? Plus, he's really, really powerful. We should go. So maybe they weren't so bad. Maybe they didn't do the wrong thing. And actually, all the Jews are going to go to this party, except one person. Who is the one person who is not going to go to the party? <laughs> so Vashti is not going to go to this party. She's going to be at another party. We're going to see in a minute. But Mordechai. Why is Mordechai not going to go to this party? There's something about Mordechai. Because? Like he realizes like it's not good for him. Or it's not good for him. Why didn't he tell everyone not to go? And why did he kind of accept that they're all going and yet he did not go? There's going to be something very interesting about Mordechai and his ancestry. Something very important. And we're going to be told his ancestry. Which tribe did Mordechai come from? You should know the answer to this question. Hello? Yeah. Which tribe did Mordechai come from? Binyamin. Binyamin is right. He's called in the Megillah, we're going to see later, Ish Yimini. He comes from the tribe of Benjamin. Does anyone know who else in history came from the tribe of Benjamin? A very, a very important person. His great great grandfather, by the way. Going back a few greats. Who is the most famous person from the tribe? There's a few people, but there's one very specific one. His name is Shaul. King Saul came from the tribe of Binyamin. King Saul came from the tribe of Binyamin. Why Shaul Saul? Why is that important? Because he's going to lose his kingship and he's going to go to another tribe, Yehuda. But Mordechai comes from his tribe. Who did King Saul have trouble with? Uh, not, from his, not from the Jewish people. We know he's going to go to David eventually. But no, there's another nation that existed in his day. Do you know who they were? What they were called? Amalek. Amalek. Who was the king of Amalek in his day, in Shaul's day? His name was Agag. Agag was his name. So we're going to see a battle between Shaul, who was from the tribe of Binyamin, and King Agag, who came from Amalek. Where is Mordechai from? Binyamin. Where is Haman from? Amalek. This is a continuation of a battle that started way before and is going to continue during this story until the end of history. But the challenge of defeating Amalek is going to shift from the tribe of Binyamin to the, tri the new tribe of kingship, which is Yehuda, which is going to be David HaMelech. And that's going to be the end of days. Akhrit Yamin before Mashiach comes. Are you following? Should we map that out for you, friends? So you have King Saul fights King Agag. Yeah. King Agag. He's from Amalek. He's the king of Amalek. He's from, that's why Haman is called Haagagi, the Agagite. Why do they mention that in the Megillah Mordechai Esther? They mention they call Haman Haagagi because he comes from Agag. Not just genealogically, but also his out outlook on life. Because he, obviously King Saul, is the king of the Jewish people, and King Agag is the king of Amalek. 
This story of Megillah is all about Amalek. They're going to be the main problem of the Jewish people now and before Mashiach comes. David Amalek is going to continue this battle. So now King Saul has a descendant called Binyamin. Sorry. King Saul has a descendant called Mordechai. Sorry. Mordechai. Right? Because King Saul came from Binyamin. Benjamin. Right? And Amalek, King Agag, is going to have a descendant called Haman. And that's what this is. So this whole story we're looking at, my dear friends, is just a capture of a piece of time. Right? It's just a piece of time. There's stuff that happened before, and there's stuff that's going to happen afterwards, and you're not going to understand the story unless you know what happened before and what's going to happen afterwards. So Mordechai not going to the party wasn't because it wasn't kosher, because it was. It wasn't because the wine wasn't kosher, it was. So why didn't he go to the party? It was kosher. It was kosher. It was kosher. It was. It had to be. It says, it was kadat. It was kadat. It was a kosher meal. It wasn't spiritually kosher, but it was kosher food there. Maybe the opinion that says it wasn't kosher, but it had to be kosher. They were eating the food and drinking the wine over there. So we're going to go with the opinion that it was. It was definitely kosher. Yeah. Okay. So what does Achashverosh want to do? He wants to show off. Uh, he wants to go on social media of his day and throw a party for everyone to come from all over the world. How long do you make such a party for? How long would you make a long party for? Wasn't that like two years? It was actually 180 days. A six month party. Six months! Six month party! You thought you had a party Saturday night. Six month party, 180 days. Why so long? Why so long? Because he's got to bring everyone from around the world to turn up. They're traveling from far and wide. So it's like in shifts. Was anyone there for all 180? No, that's crazy. Right? You've got to be like, you know, that's almost impossible. But at least you turn up, you show up, you like at the wedding. I can't be there the entire five hours. I'm not crazy. Right, turn up, mazel tov. Right, have a bit, a bit of sushi, something from the grill, and you're out. All right, that's it. What's that, what's that cuisine that we have over there? A few kebabs? Cocktail. Yeah, a little cocktail party, right? You go to the Persian one, they always have it. What's that Persian food? What's it called? Kolba. Right, it's Persia. He's got Kolba catering this whole thing, right? You can't have a party without Kolba, all that green stew, right? And the kebab, and the ginger chicken. You've got to have all this food, right? So there you are, eating away. And then they get out. However, he makes another party. And that party lasts for seven days. And who's that for? After the 180 party? For all the leaders who are living locally, just for Shushan. Just for Shushan. They're living what? Living locally. They live close by. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Why would he throw a party for so long and then a special after party just for the people who live very close by. Now remember, why is he throwing the party? Why is he throwing the party? Because he wants to show the world all of his wealth and power and to show the Jews. And what's he scared of? What's every dictator scared of? People killing him. Who's the biggest threat to a dictator? People who live far away or people who live close? The locals, right? They're the closest you can... Get in, right? If they're living a thousand miles away, it's unlikely they're going to schlep all the way just to kill you. They'll kill some soldiers, but you yourself, you're not going to get killed. So he throws a party just for them, just for them to say, ah, you're invited to the after party. By the way, hmm, was that smart, putting those seven-day party at the end? Wouldn't it be smarter to have that party at the beginning? No? What's smarter? Seven days for the locals and then the 180? Or the 180, then the seven? Interesting. Yecholiot. Okay, very good. Seven plus one is Shemir Tzeretz on the eighth day. Okay. It's not when it took place, but it's interesting. But is it smarter? Should it be the seven days and then the 180? 
or the 187. Yeah? Would, would they have been invited to the earlier days? Well? Yes. The locals would have been... This seven-day party was just for the people who in Shushan itself. So it could... It kind of is him being, like, already showing his generosity and <laughs> then kind of, like, dwelling on it even more and, like, really emphasizing, like, I'm this person, like, you're all welcome into my house, like, into my, like, palace. So it's actually a machloket, Rav and Shmuel. One opinion was he was a genius. First, when you bring people from far and wide, and then you do a special party just for your select friends. And some say he was a melech tipesh. First of all, you make the people live locally happy. That's what you should have done. And then you let everyone else come in. Because the entire 180 days, you're opening yourself up to local people attacking you. So that's a machloket. So one opinion is, as you said, Right? It makes sense. Right? The other opinion is no. He made a big, big mistake and he just got away with it. That's Rav and Shmuel trying to figure out if he was smart or he was stupid. We don't know. Fascinating. Usually we know who says which. We don't know which one says which. We actually don't even know Rav and Shmuel, which one said close or far. Very good question. The Gemara does not tell us which one. I don't know. Very interesting. Does not usually we get pins in the Gemara. It tells us here we just know it's Machloket, Rav and Shmuel. If there's a Machloket, Hill and Shammai, we're told very clearly. Here we're not told at all. Okay, a few more minutes, then we'll finish off. Baratot Oshi shows him all his wealth. Yet Yakar Tiferet Gedula Tom. Look at that word Tiferet. Look at that word and, and verse four. Tiferet. Does anyone know? Does anyone know what that word is? That word is used to describe the clothing of the Kohen Gadol. And that's how the Gemara learns that he was dressed up as the Kohen Gadol. The word Tiferet, glory, glory, is used to describe. So Mordechai Nesta put a code word. By the way, you know what he was wearing? He dressed up as the Kohen Gadol. They couldn't say it explicitly. It wouldn't be like very nice on him, right? Make him look bad. But they put in a code word to show that he was dressed like that. Gedulato yamim rabim shmonim umat yom 180 days. Okay? That's how long the party is. And the next verse, verse 5, Uvim lot ha'imim ha'eleh asa melech lechol am he made for everyone who lived near him b'shushan ha'bira in shushan ha'bira m'negedol ha'katon everyone Another seven days. So you got 180 days and then a seven day party. 180 days, seven day party. By the way, on Purim, which is going to be the holiday to celebrate this story, what do we do? We dress up, which we're going to see that's one reference to, and we eat. We eat lots of food and we drink lots of wine. Not you people, you're too young, you have grape juice. But when you're adults, turn 21, you had to drink wine, Bizrat Hashem, right? You can, because in England you have to be over 18. Right, you're the only one. But the rest of you people, as you're over 21, you can't drink. But in his day and age, they were all drinking, and we do the same. Because they drank and ate wrongfully. So we're going to be metaka, we're going to fix up their bad eating and drinking by eating and drinking for mitzvah. Okay? The entire holiday and all the mitzvot are going to come to reflect the original story in, uh, in Megillat Esther. By the way, what does Megillat Esther even mean? We didn't talk about the name itself. What is Megillah? What's a Megillah? A scroll. A scroll. Yeah, I know nowadays they have a long story because it's a long way. Megillah actually means a scroll. But the word Megillah also means something else. Write this down. Megale. What's Megale? To reveal. To reveal. Revealing. Revealing what? Esther. What's Esther? We're going to see. What does that word actually mean? That which is Nistar. Hidden. We're going to reveal that which is hidden. What are we revealing? We're revealing Megale to reveal something. Legale. Right? To reveal that which is hidden. Megillat Esther. And that's what Esther did. And she was hidden away in the palace. And we're going to see that the ultimate hiding or being clothed, right? Because when you clothe yourself, you're hiding yourself up, right? 
So the ultimate person, or not say person, the ultimate being that is completely hidden away in the Megillah is Hashem. Megillah Esther is the only book in all of Torah, in all of Nevi'im, Ketuvim, where Hashem's name is not mentioned. God's name is not mentioned. Our job is to Megaleh Hanistab, that which is hidden, which is Hashem. We have to see Hashem behind the scenes revealing what's going on. Megaleh Esther, Megillah Esther. So on the surface, it's Megillah Esther, the scroll of Esther. But they called it that to show you Megillah we have to reveal that which is hidden. Are we together, friends? So that's why Hashem's name, there's a number of reasons, but that's the main reason Hashem's name is not mentioned and there are no open miracles in the Megillah. It's all hidden away. Cool? Questions, thoughts, comments? Okay. Let us stop over there, my dear friends. And we'll pick this up with the stuff that's in the Megillah in the...